If you have it, say amen. And verse 18, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. And verse 19, And the ambush arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city and took it, and hasted it, and set the city on fire. And they set the city on fire. Thank you. You may be seated. Here in our opening text, we find Joshua, and he's standing on the side of a hill as he is about to take the city of Ai. And he stands there with a spear in his hand, and God commands him to point the spear at the city. And as he lifts the spear, the Israelite soldiers charge toward the city gates. And the scripture says that they set the city on fire. Not one small portion of the city, not just the marketplace or the town square. It says they set the entire city on fire. And I submit to you this morning, they've already kind of broken the secret here if you guys couldn't figure it out. But I submit to you this morning, let's set the city on fire. Let's set the city on fire with the power of the Holy Ghost. It is time to take the flames of revival to every house in your neighborhood, to your schools and to your friends. It is time to set the city on fire. Now, we have to understand what led up to this portion of Scripture. We first have to look back a few days prior to this. You see, they had tried and failed before. They had mustered up their soldiers and attacked the city just a few days earlier. But that ended with them retreating in defeat. And I wonder if I were to go around this room today and I were to ask you if you've ever tried to do something good for the kingdom and it fallen flat on your face in trying to do that. Maybe you got a Bible study scheduled and you studied for it and you prayed for it and and you're ready and you're on fire and you told everybody about it and you're excited and you're driving to go to the Bible study and and then they text you and they say, hey, I I, I can't do it tonight. Or maybe you invited somebody to church and then they said, oh, yeah, I'll be there, I'll be there. So you run around, you tell your friends, you call your pastor up, you say, Pastor, I've been working on this person for a while, and now they're finally going to be there, and I'm so excited, and you're coming. And, and, and of course, when we invite somebody, we come to church real early, and we make sure everything's right, and, and we got, you know, we got the, the, if you don't know the weird one in the church, you're probably the weird one in the church, but, but if you got the one, you're like, hey, hey, when my buddy comes in, you know, stay over there, but you shouldn't be like that. But we come to church, and we're excited. And then they call you and they say, oh, uh, that's today? Oh. And so they, 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 they cancel on you. I remember one time I had a friend, a coworker. He's a, a, an atheist. And I had been working on him for a while. And, and I invited him to church. And it was like a, kind of like a choir thing. So it was safer for him in his mind to come to church. And, and I thought, oh, man, this is going to be awesome. And, and he actually showed up and and. And I was so excited because I thought we're about to have one of those testimonies where an atheist says, oh, I didn't believe in God. And then I came to church and I felt the power. And I was like, this is going to happen. This is awesome. Because I, I believe that when you come into this place and the Holy Ghost begins to move, if you are hungry and you are ready and you are looking and searching, that you will find what you need to find in this place. This isn't in my notes, but on a side note, if you come to the house of God and leave the same, that's not God's fault. That isn't the praise team's fault. That's not the preacher's fault. You get what you come and expecting from the service. So my friend came and, man, we had, a, we had an awesome service. And, and I, I run up to him after service and I said, hey, buddy, what'd you think? What'd you think? And he said, as nice as he could. It, it was interesting. That's not good. So uh, from that point forward, he never accepted any of my invitations back to church. And, 
and he didn't really want to talk about God anymore at work. You see, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Not every time we invite someone, are they going to come to church? Not every time we invite somebody, are they going to walk in through that door? But I notice you guys have the same baptismal that we have. So maybe they walk through that door. We'd like for them to walk right through that door and lift their hands and immediately start speaking in tongues and then dive into the baptismal. But that doesn't happen every time. But does that mean that we give up and stop trying? Does that mean that nobody wants the gospel and we should just stop inviting people to church? Or do we keep trying? Do we keep praying for souls? And do we keep inviting people and knocking on doors? Of course we do. Because there is a city right outside of these doors that we have to set on fire. The children of Israel, after failing to take Ai, they didn't give up either. Instead, Joshua, he went before God and he asked and he said, why? Why were we unsuccessful? And, and what, what went wrong? And God tells him, there is sin in the camp. There is sin in the camp. And you see, they had just attacked Jericho. And there's a soldier by the name of a king. And he had stolen treasure and he had buried it under his tent. And because of this sin, the Israelites' attack on Ai had failed. And so Joshua does this process of elimination and he ends up finding where the treasure at is at and who had taken it. And God tells him, you can read it. God tells him, burn it with fire. He found the sin in the camp and God tells him to burn it with fire. You see, if we are going to take the flames of revival out to our city, we must first have our own personal cleansing fire. We must find a place of repentance and make sure that we ourselves are right with God. We need to have our own prayer life before we can tell someone else to have a prayer life. We must have our own walk with God before we can introduce someone to him. I can't tell you how great living for God is if I don't do it myself. I can't tell you the blessings that are found in this place if I don't come myself. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to come and worship and pray with my church before service if I don't do it myself. But I'll tell you, as I walked in this church this morning, I could tell, man, God has done some miraculous things in this place. And that there are people in this place that, that are building their own personal fires of revival. I can hear it this morning as I came in that God has done something for you. And I don't know what it is, but I want to find out. And so do they. And you have this passion inside of you. You have your own personal fire. We have to build this up in our own life and say, God, do it in me first. Start with me. God, forgive me so that I can tell the world about your grace. Set me free so I can tell the city. I wonder, I wonder how many of you today are going to leave this place on fire. On fire. With the flames of your own personal revival. How many of you are going to go leave this place today? Go to work tomorrow and tell them, God, God has been good to me. God has set me free, and he can do the same thing for you. We must have our own personal revival. Another lesson that was learned in the failure of AI was that they had only sent 3,000 soldiers when they had 40,000 available. They were going to take the city we're going to have revival. It's going to take the entire church. It is going to take everyone. If we're going to take the gospel to an entire city, it's going to take more than just a few of us. We can't assume that someone else is going to do the job and someone else is going to take care of it. No, we ourselves have to get involved. We have to knock doors ourselves and we ourselves have to do Bible studies. We can't just let someone else in this church carry the weight. But they say, if you want something done, give it to the person that's the busiest. That can't be said in the kingdom. We all have to be involved. We all have to be involved. 
I, I received a, a text message the other day. Uh, I, I coordinate some of the outreach efforts at, at our church, and I received a text from a brother in the church just randomly out of nowhere with no context that just said, if you need anything, let me know. Well, for me, I thought something had happened to me, and I just hadn't heard about it yet. Like, you know, somebody had told everybody, oh, this bad thing happened to Brandon. I just hadn't heard about it yet. And he was saying, hey, if you need anything, let me know. And, and of course, everybody across well, the entire United States is getting sick right now. And so I thought maybe he thinks I'm sick and, you know, okay, fine. So I text him back and I said, do you think I'm sick or is this something to do? And he goes, no, I, I just want to serve more this year. He said, I just want to serve more this year. He said, is there, if there's anything, if there's anything that you need help with, I just want to get more involved. I'm telling you, we need more people like that in the kingdom that don't say, well, no, so-and-so will take care of that. Or the worst one, and we're all guilty of this. Every single one of us have said this at some point in our life. That's not my job. That's not my job. Well, whose job is it? If the person that's job it's supposed to be isn't doing it, do we look at God and go, not my job? Not, I, 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 that's their job, not my job. That's in their neighborhood, not my neighborhood. That's their coworker, not my coworker. I don't think that's going to hold weight. I don't think that's going to hold weight. But instead, what we, we have to ask the question of what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And not, not in a way that says, well, what, what way can I get the most attention from this? And, 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 and is anybody going to be there that will notice? And, and will, I get, will I get credit for this thing that I'm about to do? No, what can I do to help? How can I get involved? Now, after all of this had happened, God tells Joshua, it's time to take the city. Let's try it again. And so God, side note from that, God doesn't just say, well, you failed, you're done. You don't get to take the city. He doesn't, he doesn't stop whatever he has doing in your life because you failed. He picks you back up and he puts you right back on the road again. When Jonah decided he's going to run away from him, as soon as he gets, he repents and he gets spit back on the dry land, the very next scripture, the very next verse says, now here's what you do. Here's how I get you back to work. Here's what you do. So if somebody's in this place saying, well, this is all great, but I've messed it up and I don't get to retake AI. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. God is a forgiving and grace, a graceful God. And so he's telling the children of Israel, he's telling Joshua, he communicates with him how to take AI, exactly how to take it. He says, send 30,000 men behind the city and let them lie in ambush. Take 5,000 more soldiers and have them lie at, at the entrance, on either side of the entrance of the valley at the gate. And then take the rest of the soldiers and act like you're attacking the gates of the city. And when they come out to attack you, turn and run as if you're in retreat again. And so as they begin to chase you, God says, I want you to turn and to lift your spear towards the city. And that will be a sign for your soldiers to come out of hiding and to rush the city gates. And that's when the people will set it on fire. He gave a very detailed list, instructions to Joshua what to do. The thing that stands out to me here is that God gave this very specific plan of attack to the man in charge. God didn't give the plan to everyone. He didn't give it to the soldiers. He didn't give it to the armor bearers, to the cook, to the TV evangelists, to the other church's live stream. He gave it to your man of God. He gave it to your pastor. If the soldiers had decided to do their own thing or to listen to some other leader, they would have felt like they had failed before. But instead, they look to Joshua. Instead, they look to their man of God. They look to their man of God for the vision. And the same thing applies today. The church must be unified behind their pastor. A church full of saints doing their own thing. They're going to be, they're going to be tired doing nothing. The Bible says that without vision, the people perish. And I'm sorry if this offends you, but if your vision of how you're going to have revival in this city differs from your pastors, you're the one that's wrong, not your pastor. And if you think this is the right way to do it, but your pastor says it isn't, you're wrong, not your pastor. 
The vision is given to your pastor and then he gives it to you. The vision was given to Joshua and he gave it to the soldiers. My pastor back home says it like this. The voice of God in your life sounds a lot like your pastor's. Not somebody else's pastor. Your pastor. God communicates to my pastor and then he passes it down to me. We have to be unified behind our man of God in our lives if we are going to set the city on fire. Now, as Joshua gathers everyone together, he begins to lay out the plan that God has given him. I want 30,000 30, soldiers to go behind and here and 5,000 here and so on. And, 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 and something that caught my attention as I was reading through this passage it says that as Joshua himself moved into place for the ambush, as he was getting himself ready for the battle, as he was, as he was getting ready to set the city on fire, the Bible says that he, he took the elders with him. In those days, the elders, they served not only as, as an authority figure, but they also served as an advisor to the people. They were greatly respected due to their experience and their wisdom. Joshua cherished the counsel of the elders so much that he said, as we are setting this ambush, as we are getting ready to take this city, I need your counsel. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I know that we say this and we, we hear it a lot, but we have to stop and consider it. There are elders in our midst and we have to have them. We have to have them. We can't say, well, no, 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 look, now it's my time to do this stuff. No, 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 no. Tell me, how did you do this? And how did it work for you? Tell me what you did. Because the thing that worked for them and the God that worked for them is the exact thing and the God that'll work today. It's not like it stopped working. It has continued to work. We need the elders in our lives. We need their wisdom and their counsel in our life. Not simply because of their wisdom and their counsel, but because they serve as a reminder that the God that did it for them before is still here. And the God that saved them before is still here and will do it again. There is no new way to have a revival. There is no new way to take a city. There's still only one God. There's still only water baptism in Jesus' name. You still need to receive the Holy Ghost with speaking in other tongues. Holiness still matters. Separation still matters. And the elders will remind you of that. When you start to say, well, if we change a little bit here, we might win some more people. And, and this is kind of unpopular over here. No, no, no. That's a different God. That's a different doctrine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we change one little thing about the doctrine, we are not the true church. And that is not revival. The elders, they serve, they serve as a reminder that God, God never changes. And now we find ourselves back at our opening text. And Joshua has tricked the soldiers of Ai into running down into the valley, right outside their gates. And as he crests the hill coming out of the valley, on the opposite side, Joshua he is surrounded by the elders. His troops are in place. And now, now it is the time to take the city. We've messed up before. We did it wrong before, but now, now we're doing it right. And God says we're going to take the city. There is something extremely powerful about a church that is unified. When we know what we're supposed to be doing and we're doing it, and we're not fighting with each other and we're not turning on each other and we're not saying, well, you sat in my spot and you didn't shake my hand and, oh, well, you know what? I, that was your job and you didn't do it or whatever the situation is. When a church is unified, I'm telling you, the devil's going to give you reasons to be offended and we can get caught up in that and we can allow the devil to and we can say, I was wrong and maybe you were but that doesn't mean that the kingdom doesn't still need to keep moving forward there is something powerful when everybody is unified 
And as Joshua turns to face the city of Ai, everything is perfectly in place. And he holds the spear in his hand. And the soldiers are down in the valley waiting with anticipation. And God tells Joshua, stretch your spear towards the city because I have given it into thine hands. And as he stretches the spear towards the city, all of the soldiers run in unison. They go into the city and they set it on fire. Now I want you to stop. And consider this morning, if I had an actual spear in my hand and I were to walk over to you and I were to say, who are you pointing the spear at? Who in your life are you pointing this spear at? If God told you right now, if you point this spear at someone, you can take it. You can take it. Who would it be in your life? What neighborhood in your life would you point the spear at and say, give that to me, God? What situation in your life would you point the spear at and say, God, handle this situation? If we for one one second think that it was us or the children of Israel that were taking that city. No, it is God. And he he demands the obedience. He demands the faith. If, 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 If Joshua had said, the soldiers are in place, the elders are here, All the soldiers have chased me out of the... No, I'm not going to use a spear. I'm going to use my own tactic. It would have failed. There was something about the faith in lifting the spear towards the city. Take the city. Take the city. Who is it in your life? What family member in your life have you been praying for? They just haven't, for some reason, they haven't come through. And God's saying, here's the spear. Try again. Try again. Don't stop trying. Try again. Point the spear at your family. Point your spear at your children. Point the spear at your depression. Point the spear at the anxiety in your life. And I will take it. And I will give it to you. And I will set it on fire. Satan wants to convince you that you have no impact on your city. He wants to convince you that, well, they've got it going on. And you know what? You, you're a hot mess. Because we know ourselves better than anybody else knows us. And we know how we fail and how some of us have already failed our New Year's resolutions, even though it's only day nine into the year. And we think, ah, I can't do it. But it's not us that's doing it. Stop trusting in yourself to be able to take care of it because you're right. You're right. You can't do it. When we say I'm not worthy, we're right. I am not worthy to be forgiven of my sins. But that's what makes it so beautiful is that even while I am not worthy, God, God loves me. And I'm not powerful enough to go win my family. And I'm not powerful enough to go win this city, but my God is. My God is. Don't for one second allow Satan to convince you that you are powerless and that the fire that we have right here, right now. How many times have you come to church and you, man, it is powerful and you feel it and you go, man, nothing, nothing is going to change when I leave these doors. And as soon as you step out, that feeling It's like this place is where we get the feeling from. And we we start to convince ourselves that I only get the fire while it's in here. I don't get to take the fire with myself out there. And 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 we're and that's Satan. As soon as as soon as you step out of the building, your kids start acting up. You get the phone call. You get a little a little thing on your phone that says, Hey, this boo, this bill is overdue, and, and you know you don't have enough money to pay for it. And and Satan is just going, distraction, distraction. Your fire isn't enough. The fire is in the building. Actually, when you're in there, it's just kind of group think. And you guys all like the same thing. But no, no, no. You can take the fire out of here. You can take it from here and take it to where it needs to go. 
I, I had a coworker, had a coworker. Back in 2017, you guys probably read it in the news, you just didn't know the specifics about it, but he decided to have a gender reveal party, which I don't know if anybody here has done that, so I don't want to bag on it, but hey, it's a girl, let's, just, let's do it like that. But, and I think he'll do it like that from now on. But he decided to go out and take his family and all his friends out into the desert and set up a target and fill it with pink or blue powder and then also mix in some tannerite. And for you, those of you that don't know what tannerite is, it's an extremely explosive material. And so he decided when, when, when you shoot it with a certain bullet, it ignites and explodes and it's super cool. And so he thought... I'll do that, it'll explode, and it'll be super cool, and I'll find out if we're having a boy or a girl. And, and so he decided to, to do it, and a, a week later, the fire was finally contained. It had burned 45,000 acres of the Coronado National Forest, and, and it had burned for, for a week straight, 800 firefighters were needed to contain it, and it completely destroyed multiple of his coworkers' homes. So imagine having to come to work with somebody you had just burned their house down or a gender reveal. And at the end of it, it was $8.1 million worth of damage. And he was facing prison time for it. So now he doesn't have a job and he has to pay $500 every month for the rest of his life, which still won't get close to the $8.1 million he owes, all from a gender reveal. So why am I telling you this story? What's the significance of it? I don't want you to underestimate the power of asking one person for a Bible study. It's just one person. It's just one person. It's just a baby gender reveal, right? Like, like well, how much can really happen from this? And it's just one person I'm inviting to church, and how much impact can I have? Yeah, maybe I didn't ask one person to come to church, but really, I mean, everybody else in the church was doing it, and nah, we're having a revival, but I'm just not part of it. We had a, a minister in our church, the power of just one Bible study. We have a minister in our church who was looking for a place to host a Bible study on the south side of Tucson. And he, he was driving around looking for all these different places, going to community centers, going to different churches, and saying, hey, can I rent a place out so we can do Bible studies here? We wanted, he wanted to have like a central location where not just his house, but an area where the people can know that's where we have Bible studies at. And everybody had been falling through for him, excuse me. And uh, he started to feel like maybe, maybe God doesn't want me to have a Bible study in this area. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm going to the wrong spot. And the last place that he drives by, he walks in and they say, yeah, sure, you can do a Bible study here. And so slowly over time, a very long story, making it very short, this, this minister in our church, he is a true Christian. He is a great man. And so that begins to impact your environment. When you have the Holy Ghost, it begins to impact your environment. You, it, you can't help it. When you're around darkness, your light is going to be just brighter from that. When you're around flammable substance and you're a Holy Ghost ball of fire, it is going to ignite it. And so he's around these people that are Trinitarian. He's just using their building so that they can, well, they start to feel the impact of the flame and they start to feel the impact of his fire and, and something's different ab about you and and you're just doing bible studies here but what is it and so he started to help them it's an older uh, the congregation's an older congregation and so he started to help them with maintenance and taking care of stuff around the church and and he would go mow the lawns and he would go fix their pipes and do all this stuff and and, and it began to the, the fire began to spread just a little bit further and and then just a little bit further the impact of just one bible study remember so uh, time after time gone by, and I think it was about right, right around the year mark that they were there, they approached him, the, the, the staff from this church, and they said, listen, we're, we're, we're getting older as a church, and we're not winning people in, and, and, and we know that, that, that you, you, you have something different. Because yeah. we do. Yeah. Well, I should say, we don't have something different. We have the truth. We have the truth. They have something different. And they recognize that what they have is different from us. We're not counterculture. We're not anti the culture. They're anti what the truth is. God has said this is the truth. Sorry, side note. Back to the story. 
So they come to him and they say something is different here. And they go, we like to, to sell you the church. Well, this is just a little old minister. Sell me the church. Okay, it's got four and a half acres. It's got a full kitchen. It's got a, a fellowship hall. It's got Sunday school rooms. It has staff offices. It's a beautiful church. I don't think I'm going to be able to afford that. And they go, oh, I think you will. And so they said, we want to sell it to you for $20. Whoa. For $20. This is the power of one Bible study. If I'm, if, I, if I'm correct, I think that they're signing the final documents today. They're waiting on one last person to come in. And now that minister has a church, an extension of faith tabernacle for $20, all because of one Bible study. Of one Bible study. I want to set up a Bible study in this area. And God goes here. I'll give you the city. Here you go. Here's the church. Here. If you have $20. And we did this. We did this ceremonial thing around the church. We all gave a dollar so we could help pay for the church. And it's this wonderful thing where God responds to somebody that takes the spear in their life. And they point it at the area. And they say, give me this city. Give me this city. Now, I want us to stop and think is after they, after they had taken this city and, and, and AI is on fire. It says in the Bible, they burned it completely to the ground. And, and, and there would be smoke and flames rising from this, this city, former city. And that served as an announcement to all the other cities in the vicinity. It served as an announcement that the people of God are in the land. We are in the land. As you read over the next chapter, all the other cities that they attacked after AI, they surrendered. They didn't want to be attacked anymore. No, no, we saw what you did to AI. No, 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 no. We, we yield. And so I want you to stop and think. I want you to stop and consider why, why, why would it be any different for us today? Not only for this church, for Soul, Souls Harbor, not only for Souls Harbor as a, as a church body. As you unify and you move out in the city, as I know that you already are, but as you take neighborhoods and as you take families, who's to say that God doesn't give you the other ones and they yield? If I take this neighborhood, the next neighborhood just falls right in line. If I take this coworker, the next coworker falls right in line. Not only for the church, but in your own personal life. God, I give this thing to you. I lift this spirit to this thing in my life. And, and, and then God takes that addiction from you. What, what other addiction? What other addiction falls? What other thing that you're struggling with falls when you defeat the first one by being obedient and having faith in God? I want you to seriously consider this. We say things in church that kind of, I feel like it just goes right over our heads because we've heard it a million times before. But did God say that the harvest is ready? Ask yourself that. Did he say it in his word? The thing that's beautiful about the word, the thing that I love the most about the Bible, I can go to Barnes and Noble right now, or I don't know, whatever bookstore is popular right now. I can go to amazon.com and buy a book, right? And I can say, this book's going to say, get rich, right? How to get rich. And I can read it. And that's that guy's opinion on how to get rich. And maybe I apply those things in my life and it actually works. Maybe it doesn't. But when I open this word... When I open the Bible and I read what's in this Bible, it is going to happen. It is going to happen. One of my favorite verses, and this is kind of funny, but it really is my favorite verse. It says that even a fool, when he keeps his mouth shut, appears to be wise. And I need that a lot in my life. I'm not, I, it's funny, but it, I read that to myself a lot. 
because I got a lot of opinions about a lot of different things. And so I want to say something and then I'll walk away. And my wife will be like, why did you say that? You, you didn't have anything to say. You, that had nothing to do with you. And I'm like, ha, ha, I said something. And then I look like an idiot. But if I had just listened to the Bible and I kept my mouth shut. So I say that. What else does the Bible say? But the harvest. The harvest is ready. It's ready. But unfortunately, the next thing is true as well. But the laborers, they're few. Don't let that be said of Souls Harbor. That there's a harvest right outside your doors. But you don't want to work it. That there, there is a city right here and I'm just too busy on Saturdays. Everybody is too busy on Saturdays. What enemies shake in fear around this church because they know if they just found out the fire that is at their altar and they just discovered that it would decimate this area it's time that, that that we let our cities know that a global pandemic couldn't stop this fire and and it never will that unrest in our streets and riots in our streets couldn't stop this fire, and it never will. That threats of persecution will not silence this fire, and it never will. I say let the, the fires of revival that burn here at Souls Harbor serve as a fire signal to the rest of everyone in this vicinity that mercy is found here and that salvation is found here and that if you need something, if you want to meet the creator of the universe, that this is the place you do it at. Now in closing, after the Israelites had taken the city, Joshua gathered everyone around together and he built an altar. And now... In this story, there is one more fire that, that burns bright as they offer sacrifices to God. The Bible says that after he built an, offer, an altar and offered a sacrifice on it, that Joshua read the law for everyone. You see, Joshua knew that just taking the land wasn't enough. For the real victory, he had introduced them to the one true living God. And what better way to do that than to build an altar and to read the word. Yes. To those of you who are guests here this morning, I'm not from this church. I don't know if you're a guest or not, but if you are a guest, Come on. Hmm, I want you to know, I want you to know, I don't need to be from this church to know this, that this altar right here, yes. this altar right here is not only for repentance, but it's a place where we gather and we worship our God. And it's where we come to thank him for his blessings. It's where we come to find mercy and grace. It's where we lay our burdens down and have our addictions broken. This altar is where we come to reignite the fire within our souls. And to the guests that are here, you are welcome at this altar. This can be your altar as well. And for those of you that call this church home, I want to remind you, this altar is where we find our strength. This altar is where we can commune with the creator of the universe. And if it's been a while since you have felt the fire of the Holy Ghost burn deep within you, I ask that you come and be refilled. But don't keep the fire here in this sanctuary. You have to take the flames of revival out into your neighborhoods. You have to take it to your schools, into your workplace, to your gym. You have to take it everywhere. Take the flames from this altar and set your city on fire.